Okay, um, welcome everyone to our uh, Spring Economic Forum, where we present our UK and global economic outlooks. My name is Stephen Millard. I'm the Deputy Director here at NISA for Macroeconomic Modeling and Forecasting. And I'm uh, joined by Barry Naisbet, who will, who will be presenting our global economic outlook. Kimar White, who will be presenting the uh, aggregate picture for the UK, and uh, Anab Bhattacharji, who will be presenting the regional and household analysis that we do in our UK economic outlook. We very much uh, want this to be um, interactive in the sense of we want you to be asking us lots of questions. If you can do that through the chat, then once the presentations are out of the way, I will call on them. Um, I, I, I'll unmute you enable you to ask your questions. But if you put them into the chat first, then I, then I know who wants to ask a question. Um, <clears throat> that's pretty much it from me. So I'm gonna hand over straight away to Barry Naisbert, who's gonna talk us through our view as to the global economic outlook. Thank you, Barry. Thanks very much, Stephen. And good morning, everyone. And welcome to our uh, spring. Outlook. Um, my my role is really to talk about our global economic outlook, which um, is the work of a, a team of people, and I'm just presenting it. So my thanks to all the people who've uh, helped us to put this forecast together. Um, in terms of the global outlook, um, I think the, the way in which we talk about things is we talk about the global economy having been hit by two shocks in recent years. Um, so the first shock was COVID and the second shock was uh, Russia's war in Ukraine. But I think it's also important that we should talk about the responses to those shocks because they, those responses, as well as the shocks, have helped to determine the position that we're now in and the outlook that we now have. And I'd want to pick up three particular responses that are, I think, very important. The first one is the, the lockdowns and the behavioral responses to COVID that we saw. And in some cases, we're still seeing. And one of those that uh, I will talk a little about later on is supply chain dislocation. The second one is rapidly rising inflation. And I'm gonna say, especially in advanced economies. And part of that, I will argue, is due to the su supply chain dislocation, initially partly due to that, and then the effects of Russia's war in Ukraine on various supplies and prices of supplies. And then thirdly is the rapid monetary tightening that we've seen in response to both the shocks and the effect of the shocks. So that's the background that I, I feel we have to our outlook for the global economy for the next couple of years. So if we think back um, to middle of last year, let us say, economies had recovered quite quickly from the initial fall in GDP that the COVID shock resulted in, as you can see from this chart here where we're showing GDP in China, the US and the Euro area in an index level form. But um, they were then hit by the effects of the war in Ukraine from Q1 last year and new waves of COVID, particularly in China. And as a result, we saw um, a sort of um, very sluggish growth last year in the US and Euro area. Um, almost a flat lining as we we're coming into this year, and obviously a, a, a much more subdued pattern of activity in China. Um, the other notable thing last year was, of course, that inflation picked up very rapidly. And um, the next chart shows a comparison of uh, our own forecasts that we made in our winter forecast last year. So that would have been published in February, done in January. 
and the actual outturn for inflation last year in a range of economies. Um, someone said we we're quite brave to show how wrong we were, but I think it's important that we should look back at our own forecasts and think about what has happened and why did we say what we did. Um, and what you can see in that the European countries, the advanced economies, the G7 economies, you can see that inflation, the black bars here, has turned out to be much higher than we anticipated um, just 15 months ago. Um, for China, Brazil, and to some extent India, the, the emerging economies, um, our inflation forecasts were much closer to the outturns. The inflation that's happened as a result of the invasion in Ukraine and other things as well, um, looks like very much an advanced economy phenomenon and one that we're still going through. The other thing that happened as a result, of course, of that, as I mentioned earlier, is that monetary policy tightened rapidly in advanced economies. Um, the, the point that um, I would want to focus on here, in a sense, is the speed of tightening. Um, just as we saw yesterday in the UK, yet another month or yet another MPC meeting, yet another increase in interest rates. So we've seen a rapid increase in interest rates um, in the ECB, in the US and in the UK. As central banks probably slow to recognise the threat of higher inflation. And the key question then is, when will this tightening halt? So to, to think, think about those things, um, let's say where we are now on output. And we're looking here at the percentage change in output between the end of 2019 and the start of this year. Um, again, comparing to our forecasts. So this is our forecast from January 2020, our, our, our winter 2020 forecast. And you can see that um, some of our forecasts, China, for example, um, even the US and, and certainly Japan, quite close to where we are in terms of how far GDP is expanded. The countries where it's very different, France, Germany, um, the U UK, um, r relate to the effects of the higher inflation and the slower growth in world trade, uh, the supply chain dislocations. Um, India, I mean, perhaps in this case, we were just a bit too optimistic about growth in India because output in India fell very rapidly in 2020 as COVID hit. Um, this year, we're now forecasting GDP growth for the global economy of two and a half percent. And two and a half percent growth will be the slowest rate of global growth, excepting obviously the COVID hit year of 2020 since 2009. We're expecting a little bit of a pickup next year, 2.8%, uh, particularly helped by stronger growth in post-lockdown China. But the, the picture is not of a sharp rebound in economic growth. It's, it's in a sense more of the same in terms of slow steady growth in terms of inflation and i've rather couched it as inflation is a main problem for um the advanced economies we think that headline inflation has actually peaked in most of those economies if not all of them but core inflation underlying inflation so by and large taking out food and energy costs um, may not have peaked yet. Um, we had some perhaps encouraging figures out yesterday for the US on CPI and core CPI, but they weren't spectacular. Um, but one of the, the worries that we have is that uh, perhaps the steadiness of core inflation um, is going to lead to more persistent inflation over the coming year or so. Um, when, we, when one talks about inflation forecasts, often one talks mostly about sort of oil prices or 
uh, gas prices coming down. But one of the other interesting features is that global supply chain pressures are waning now. This is uh, from the New York Federal Reserve Bank, their measure of global supply chain pressure index. As you can see, it's now weaker than almost any time since 2018, which we think is positive for lower inflation to come. And so as a result, we're expecting inflation to fall, but um, the main part, the main part of the fall will be second half of this year, first half of next year. Um, but inflation still remains, you know, within that period, relatively um, slightly higher than would have been expected from targets if we were to go back a little way. Now, that's our central case. What about risks? Well, I guess there's three we would point to. I mean, there, there are more than three and the, 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 the global economic outlook talks about more than three, but um, obviously it started from the bottom. The, the war in Ukraine is still continuing and we still don't know how that will add, add play out. Um, monetary policy may be tightened too much. Um, we, we're thinking one more increase in, by the Fed and uh, up 50 basis points by the ECB. And then probably the one that we'd focus on at the moment as, as being a more interesting one is the risk of a US recession. Um, the yield curve slope in the US is steeply inverted. And that's often a sign of a recession in the 12 months following the inversion. The, the figure we show here is from the New York Federal Reserve, the recession probability indicator, which is running at the moment of over 50 percent. Um, it's not to say that recession is inevitable, but to say that it clearly appears, at least from one respectable indicator, as a key risk for global economies. Let me finally just leave you with our forecast summary. Um, of the table, which just shows where, where our forecasts lie for the various economies, not changes since then. And thank you very much for listening to me. And let me hand over to my colleague, Kimar White, to talk about the outlook for the UK economy. Thank you, uh, Barry. So I'll be presenting the outlook for the UK economy, which um, much like our global outlook is very much a team effort. So I'd like to thank the persons listed on screen here. So the, uh, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So the, um, so the recent growth, uh, recent growth estimates by the published by the ONS um, suggest that there is some reason for optimism with the UK economy now expected to have grown by about 0.1% in the first quarter of this year. And we expect the UK to avoid a recession. But nevertheless, we do expect sluggish growth this year and in 2024 of, of around 0.3 and 0.6% respectively before reaching just over uh, 1% in 2025. So although our forecast or central case forecast suggests we will avoid a uh, technical recession, the anemic growth and the ongoing cost of living crisis together with the possibility of you know, rising unemployment will lead to a lot of um, households certainly feeling like they are experiencing a recession. And this is why we um, at NISA, we continue to argue that we should not be tied to this um, definition of two negative quarters of GDP growth as the sort of working definition for a recession, for recessionary conditions in an, in an economy, but rather to think about it in broader terms. Now, looking at the um, real disposable income, um, we saw very slight uh, improvement in the final quarter of this year um, for the first time in around um, four quarters. But we think that this is likely to be short lived and we now forecast real household personal disposable income to fall this year. 
And this will, of course, largely be contingent on the rate of inflation, so how inflation slows, and also the level of uh, pay increases. Now, as we turn to uh, inflation, we've seen where CPI inflation fell to 10.1% uh, in March from around 10.4% in February. Now, the high rate was driven largely by food price inflation, which came in at around 19.1% and also by uh, wage settlements. Now, the external inflationary shock to food and energy prices, which has, of course, been caused by the war in Ukraine, has brought about you know, far more persistent and sort of broad-based underlying inflationary pressures in the UK than we previously expected. Now, if we look at the chart here, which compares the or headline CPI inflation with two measures of um, underlying inflation, one which is the core CPI inflation. So if you look at the gray line, which excludes food and energy, and also NISA's measure of a trimmed mean inflation, which is the red line. So the, the trimmed mean inflation excludes the 5% largest price changes on either end of the um, of the CPI distribution. So what is clear from the chart is that all three measures of inflation are extraordinarily elevated compared to, uh, to compared to recent times. And of course, this high rate of core inflation suggests that headline inflation will exhibit um, uh, more persistence in 2023. So as a result of this, um, on the next slide, we can see our forecast for inflation. So as a result of the persistence in core inflation and also the likely wage inflation resulting largely in part from the current wave of industrial unrest that we've been seeing, we continue to expect you know, inflation to remain persistently above target. In particular, we expect CPI inflation to fall to only just under about five and a half percent by the end of this year, and also not to reach the Bank of England's target of two percent until the middle of 2025. And this, of course, you know, um, creates a dilemma for the MPC, given that inflation remains stubbornly high, um, but also that we are experiencing sluggish growth in the economy. So. What has happened or what, what can the bank do as a response? Well, the bank yesterday increased um, rates by 25 basis points, reaching 4.5%. Um, and I think two big questions um, um, following what happened are whether we think that this is the peak and also will rates stay higher for longer? Well, to answer the first question, uh, our forecast suggests that this is the peak. If you look at um, the chart we have here, and we, we, we had closed our forecast well in advance of clearly yesterday's announcement. So we had anticipated a 25 basis points increase um, in, the, in, the, in the policy rate. And, but of course, there's every chance that the bank increases further given um, depending on how inflation develops. And to use you know, Governor Bailey's words, they, they need to stay the course. And, but staying the course could also mean to stay in higher for longer, which brings me to my next question. And I think the, um, if we just go back to the previous slide, so which brings us to the next question, which is whether we think inflation, uh, sorry, would rates will stay higher for longer. Well, given the persistence that we've seen that I've showed you on the previous slide in the core inflation, then bank, the bank might indeed have to stay higher for longer in order to bring inflation back to its target of um, 2%. Now, turning to uh, fiscal policy. So we are expecting a lower debt to GDP ratio than the OBR over the medium term. And of course, these forecasts are based on you know, particular assumptions about um, growth and inflation over the coming five years by both us and, and the OBR. So this, of, we think, has um, generated greater fiscal space. And why is this? Well, on the next slide, um, 
where we show our forecast compared to our inflation forecast compared to the um, to the OBR. So we're saying that the greater amount of fiscal headroom is a direct result of the implicit in inflation tax on the government bondholders. Now, given our belief that inflation will be higher for longer than expected by the OBR, so if you look at the the red line here, which shows the OBR's forecast compared to the black line, which shows our most recent forecast. There's a um, stark difference there between where we think inflation will be over the medium term. And we think that this impact can be considerable given the large chunk of government liabilities which are denominated in nominal terms. Now, uh, finally, if I turn to the labor market, no, the um, there still remains, you know, shortages in the labor market. And despite the marginal decrease in the inactivity rate from around 21.3% to 21.1%, the, the workforce participation rate remains, you know, below its pre-pandemic levels, which is clearly a cause for concern amidst all the relatively, the still relatively hot and tight labor market rather. Now, during the pandemic, students and you know those suffering from long-term illnesses explain the bulk of the high inactivity rate but recent data suggests that you know students and those aged 16 to 24 those um that those age group are returning to the labor force largely as a result of the the cost of living crisis so they have to be you know eaten into their savings however the long-term sick has remained the largest group within the inactive population if you look at the I want to say purple bar here, um, but forgive me if I get the color wrong. It's the purple shaded bar here, which represents the um, the long term six. So they, you know, that has reached a peak, um, the highest level it has been, rather sorry, until since the pandemic. Now the weakness in labor force participation is in part, you know, reflecting um, those with ill health, and this might have, you know, exacerbated the tightness in the labor market. Now we think that the chancellor you know made a number of announcements aimed at increasing you know labor labor force participation and also addressing the labor uh, market shortages and this include this included you know discouraging early retirement through the you know more generous pension allowances and also encouraging more women into the labor force clearly by subsidizing childcare costs and offering you know more support but Whilst we think that those are steps in the right direction, we still feel that the budget fell short of, you know, implemented comprehensive and targeted strategy to tackle the sort of acute issues, you know, causing a tight labor market, which is clearly the, you know, the high economic inactivity rate. Now, finally, just to, to, to sign off, I'll say that a lot more is needed you know, for, you know, stronger productivity growth to return to uh, the economy. And then I'll finally just leave you with a summary of our forecast before handing over to my colleague Arnav, who will speak on the regional outlook. Thank you. Thank you, Kamar and uh, Barry before that, and Stephen, of course, and uh, every, everyone else uh, uh, participating in this process. As ever, this is uh, very much uh, joint work, collaborative work. So my immense thanks to colleagues uh, who have contributed to us this chapter, but also it works together with the global and the uh, UK economic outlook. Um, so uh, immense thanks to uh, everyone. Um, now on the regional outlook, the central uh, picture that we want to bring today uh, are basically three things. There are hardest hit households. There are households who are going, who are being, you know, hit very hard by a combination of factors which we are going to discuss. It is immensely important, also not only for helping these households but also regenerating the regions to bring about better uh, leveling up for choice of a, um, and want of a better world and policy options. At the backdrop of this. Of course, we take into account what has been going on in the global economy and in the economy, which my colleagues uh, Barry and Kemar have uh, pointed out quite eloquently. Uh, 
Um, number one, there's the feature of core inflation, which is staying steadily high, higher, you know, higher. And uh, therefore, this implies persistent inflation as well. Supply chain pressures are waning, which is true. However, we still expect food prices and food price inflation to stay high in the medium run. Rising unemployment and sluggish participation. Fall in personal, uh, real personal disposable income. And then, of course, the availability of a reasonable amount of fiscal headroom to try and develop policy from. So the key messages on UK households is that the country as a whole has been getting poorer. But what we want to focus on today is on the distributional implications and the regional implications of this. In particular, living standards are lower in 23-24 today compared with pre-COVID levels. But how much lower? This depends on where you are on the income distribution. For the lowest quintile, it is about 20% lower compared to pre-COVID levels, pre-pandemic levels, and 5% for, for the top quintile. So we think as a combination of factors, policy support has helped cushion the blow of the recent inflationary shock, energy and food prices largely, but this does not compensate for the full impact of higher inflation, which has eroded into the purchasing power, particularly of poor households, together with shortfall in wage growth, which is not keeping up with uh, rate of inflation and the freezing of income tax thresholds. Now, these three factors combined, therefore mean income shortfalls. Uh, and here we show these income shortfalls uh, graphically by quintile in 23-24 relative to 2019-20. Uh, and the important fact is that it is about 20% or more than 20% for households in the lowest decile at the left here. And it is about 4,000 pounds or a bit more lower for these households. That accounts for more than 20% of their, what would have been their disposable income or what their disposable income should have been if they were growing in the at the rate of inflation. What this then implies is that across the whole of the distribution, we have a cumulative impact of price shocks and policy interventions. The lower income households almost all the way up to the middle of the distribution actually are taking a big hit from wages and incomes not keeping pace with inflation. Policy support has been available, has been provided for through the largely through the universal credit uh, vehicle at the lowest end, but then we still have a picture of the squeezed middle, which is quite concerning. And we urge the chancellor and fiscal policy in general to act more in that dimension, particularly against the backdrop also of increasing debt and increasing unsecured debt in particular at very high interest rates together with increases in mortgage repayments are going to put a further dent on middle income households. So putting this in perspective, our date and savings outlook says that, well, last year we, we have already looked at the evolution of savings. A quarter of UK households were set to see their savings drawn down, even decimated 
by the end of 2024. If we now look at unsecured debt, we find that this precariousness, this stress on household finances varies not only across the income distribution, but also regionally. So on the maps, which we show here, on the left map, we have unsecured debt. This is as of Q4 2021. So this shows places which already had very high unsecured debt in 2021 at the middle, during the middle of the pandemic crisis. And on the right hand side, we have households with no savings by the end of projected by the end of 2024. We see that these largely fall upon similar lines along similar lines, they fall on similar places on the map. So what this then implies is that the regional picture shows particularly the Northeast and Northern Ireland are going to suffer the most. Households in those places are going to suffer the most, but also other places across the country, including places in the North and in the Midlands. Putting all this together, we think there are important policy options which must be taken to help the households. Inflation is falling, core inflation is not, and food price inflation is going to continue to rise. So price levels will remain permanently high compared to prior COVID and the cost of living crisis. So we suggest that the social discount tariff, which is welcome, but we also need a variable price cap and we have written about this quite extensively in the previous outlooks. We also think that in the medium run, to address problems created by sluggish trade, we need to improve trade and trade relations with the European Union. And importantly, productive capacity, particularly for food, housing, and renewable energy. Coming to the regions now, we think that no devolved nation or English region has experienced a recession. Well, good news, technically. Almost all parts are seeing robust levels of employment as well, or return to employment, which is also good news. All devolved regions, devolved nations are at pre-COVID levels in terms of economic output. However, among in English regions, the South and East and the Midlands are still below pre-COVID levels. The South and East now projected to recover next year, but the Midlands still lagging. Remember that the, in the Midlands, there have been uh, severe uh, pressures due to a falling trade. How does this show up across regions? Well, London keeps powering ahead in terms of um, employment here, and other regions are sluggish. In particular, we can see the situation here for the Midlands and amongst devolved nations, also Northern Ireland. Much the same picture evolves for output as well. So in terms of GVA, gross value added, regional output, London is highest and the Midlands are lagging. Uh, Scotland has benefited a little bit from the COP26 summit and the uh, outcomes in terms of employment in particular, um, but it lies somewhere in the middle. So it is a mixed picture. It is a picture of continued divergence across the regions. Regional productivity, once again, nothing much is changing here. We see London quite a bit higher than the UK average and continue to power ahead, productivity increasing there, projected productivity. South and East as well, 
slightly higher productivity than UK as a, uh, on average, and Scotland about keeping up with the average, but other regions and devolved nations are lagging behind. But these are persistent problems. And so what are the policy options, particularly focusing on the supply side, what we think is very important is now for the government to also focus on raising productivity by bringing in or encouraging higher investments. Here, we plot the public investments over time, over a very long, over a long period from 19, all the way from uh, you know, the Second World War to now. And you can see in recent periods, well, recent periods still meaning from the 80s, essentially, public investment has been lagging behind. We need to increase this to have any chance of increasing productivity as a whole. And public investment in particular you know, has the potential of also bringing in private investment. Our thinking is that total public investment needed is in the region of 3% of GDP over the OBR's forecast horizon. This is slightly higher than what the OBR is suggesting, which is about 2%. It amounts to approximately 435 billion or 80 billion per year. So the government's plan is to reach about 2% of GDP, which is over 60 billion. So the difference is not huge. And given the fiscal space that the government has to play with, this is potentially better for the future of the country to try and take us out of this low wage, low productivity state that we, we find ourselves in. So to sum it all, in terms of policy options, we suggest a new fiscal framework with a focus on public investment levels rather than somewhat arbitrary debt and deficit targets. In particular, institutions that can support this will be very important like a national development bank, similar to KFW bringing together the National Infrastructure Commission and the UK Investment Bank, but basically you know, also widening the remit uh, beyond infrastructure to include housing, renewable energy, and so on. And leveling up requires better coordination, stronger institutions, rebuilding of state capacity, in particular, also greater devolution of powers to the local authorities or down the chain. In summary, or in conclusion, households need more certainty and fairness, particularly in terms of energy support once the energy price guarantee expires. An important lesson, I think, for policy is that the purpose of policy is to reduce uncertainty rather than enhancing it, exacerbating it, Policymakers must intervene early, provide stability, and target fiscal policy on hardest hit households. This is very important from a national and fairness perspective. And leveling up requires a switch from short-term thinking to long-term investment strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. We're, we're now gonna move on to questions. Uh, I have three questions in the chat, which I'll come to first, but um, if you want to ask a question, feel free to either put the question into the chat or just raise your hand uh, and I'll, I'll come to you eventually. But let, let's start with the questions we have. Paul Cheshire, Paul, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? If you can. Can you hear me now? We can, we can. Thank you, Paul. Off you Excellent. Go. Uh, now, my question was about the map that uh, Anab sh uh, sh showed just now of uh, unsecured household uh, debt and household debt. I wondered whether the, you had fully offset for the regional distribution of household incomes. That is, is part of the spatial effect actually a household effect? Thank do you. I go into that now, or uh, do you want to collect questions? Well, I was, was going to say, well, why, 
if you hold off for now, Anna, um, Richard Tufts has also got a question about your presentation. So Richard, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Go ahead, Richard. Okay, um, I'll tell you what, I'll ask it on your behalf <laughs> in that case. Um, the question from Richard is, Does do we, NISA, see any coherent industrial policy for UK and regions, for example, smart specialization strategies at regional level, Will the devolution models for Manchester and the West Midlands uh, help in the medium to long term? Okay, if you'd like to take those two questions, Arnab, and then uh, and then I'll have two questions for Kimar. Um, thank you. Uh, brilliant questions. Uh, 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 thanks a lot, uh, both Paul and uh, Richard. These are uh, uh, very important questions. So on the question of household debt, uh, no, it is uh, it is not adjusted for income. So. Partly uh, the income disparities across the country uh, come in here. Also to point out uh, in, in terms of both questions, one of the things that we are doing at the National Institute is uh, slowly starting to create a dashboard of regional indicators across the whole country. This is uh, based on a project funded by the uh, Nuffield Trust. And, uh, the, and, and uh, so this is part of uh, you know, the, the dashboard that we are building in. Of course, at a later stage, we are going to put in, try to understand in further detail what this means in terms of how we can model this or understand this better in terms of income and other disparities. But no, at the moment, this is a visual representation of per capita household debt across the different regions, not adjusted for income. On the question of a uh, infrastructure uh, of a, a industrial strategy, well, we have lagged an industrial strategy for uh, or planning uh, uh, for a long time in this country, and it is actually becoming quite important in our view, particularly given the productivity problems that uh, the country as a whole faces, and particularly parts of the country um, mm. are more than others. Um, so is, uh, is the devolved administrations or, or the structure of devolution in uh, uh, Manchester, et cetera, going to help? Well, certainly we think that it has promise, but how far again it helps and et cetera will uh, partly depend on um, how good, the, you know, how, how, whether we are able to build appropriate institutions in these places. And also we are going to supplement the work done at the local level with our own modeling, and, and you're going to see more of this uh, in the coming days from the National Institute, particularly in terms of our work on uh, trying to build a regional dashboard and a regional regeneration index. Thank you, Anna. Um, I'm now going to collect a couple of questions for Kamar. <laughs> Hopefully, people will be able to unmute themselves. We never know. Rena Ferrer. Rena, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Go ahead. Any luck, Rena? I, um, I just don't think we're having a good day today. So I'm, I'm sorry, Rena, I'll, I'll ask your question on your behalf if that's okay. And the question is, why do you think the Bank of England got the inflation forecast so wrong when many others expected inflation to remain higher in 2023? Was it perhaps a policy decision to to influence inflation expectations? That was Rena's question. Um, I'm going to try, and this will be the last time I try. Chris Cormack. Chris, if you want to try and unmute yourself and ask your questions. Hi there. Um, thank, thanks for the presentations. So one, one question, hopefully you can, you can hear me well. So 
In terms of the challenges, you know, I was speaking from a perspective of building innovation um, with, within the UK. So obviously we've had a, a recent rise in corporation tax and obviously personal marginal tax for high earners, those that could potentially add value in terms of growing opportunities in the UK. Has the team formed a, a view on terms of the impact of foreign direct investment, especially regarding innovation? And obviously we know the government policy um, has, has, has indicated a, an enhancement in terms of subsidies, in terms of innovation, but obviously there has also been some challenge with respect to the EU Horizons programme as well. So has the team um, obtained a view as to the impact of foreign direct investment of, and how that can help stimulate the economy um, from the private sector, if you like? Thank you, Chris. So Kimar, one on uh, corporation tax, investment subsidies and FDI. And one question on are the Bank of England trying to uh, get our ex inflation expectations down by producing a deliberately low forecast? I think you're still muted, Kamar. Can you hear me now? We can now, thank you. <laughs> Most people prefer me muted anyway. Um, so, yeah, thanks for the question, um, Irina. Um, the, yeah, the bank, I think, the, the bank did get its, um, you know, forecast, inflation forecast wrong. Um, many people did um, get it wrong. I mean, we can argue about who got it more wrong. But yeah, I think the bank has more of a duty to, you know, control inflation expectations. And I think, you know, signaling that inflation, you know, could be much higher, could have, you know, obviously had that permeated through the economy and, you know, risk the anchoring inflation um, expectations. So what I think also I think is an, an interesting point or interesting question rather is how the bank had reacted to, to, to inflation. So one argument is that, you know, whether the bank should have responded sooner. This is on the back of um, the, you know, the reopening of the economy back in 2021, when, you know, many people would have anticipated the pent up demand that we had during uh, lockdown would have, you know, bore fruit even before we start, started having the, you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So whether or not the bank should have, you know, been responding then. Now, obviously, it's this is easy to say in hindsight. Um, you know, everything seems obvious in hindsight, and even ourselves at NISA, you know, got the inflation forecast wrong back then. We did not expect inflation to be that high, and we weren't saying to that the bank should have been, you know, increasing rates um, then. But and in the bank's defense, the bank could argue that had it been you know more aggressive in 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 its you know in in rate in raising rates earlier then you know that would have you know risk threatening um unemployment in the economy and affecting financial markets and also particularly on the back of covid you know risk having you know sort of deflation within the economy so i think the bank had you know many challenges at hand did the bank get things wrong maybe um, but I think, you know, the important thing as it stands now is the bank trying to, you know, control this, um, control inflation with the, you know, the tools um, at hand. On the question, um, I hope that answered your question, by the way, um, Rina. With the, the question on, um, on the corporation mm -hmm. taxes, now, yes, we do think that we have, you know, thought about the the impact of you know corporation taxes particularly on some of our work around you know the spring budget and also the the, the mini budget prior um prior to that and what 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 we think or what what are you know our analysis you know has shown that you know increases in the corporation you know taxes will clearly you know, hurt the supply side of um, in, of the economy in in the long run, and there's an argument that you know you know increases in these in, in corporation taxes will you know can you know disincentivize um, investment, 
and we and and there's a clear need for um, investment in the in the UK economy, particularly given the productivity challenges that the the UK um, currently face, and of course that will also have an impact on FDI because with you know higher higher corporation taxes, and 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 also let's not ignore the the sort of impact of you know Brexit, which is the you know the big elephant in the room. We have that 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 has also been having a lot of um, impact on um, FDI within uh, within the UK economy. So yes, indeed, I think you know, in a, you know, changes to the corporation taxes will you know will does have an impact on that, particularly in the long run, the supply side of the economy, and potentially to disincentivize um, investment. Thanks, Kamal. Um, two more questions for Anna coming up. Glenn Bramley. Glenn, do you want to um, unmute yourself? Can you hear me now? We can. We can. Okay. Yeah. So my question is whether there, uh, uh, in, in response to the severe cost of living pressure on the lowest income groups, um, is there not also a significant need to raise basic level of working age benefits, universal credit, personal allowances to lift some of these groups out of destitution and tackle the de debt and severe living standards effects, which Arnep has, uh, has highlighted, as well as the, uh, you know, the investment, you know, if there's any fiscal headroom, should that not also be a priority? Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Um, and I have a question here from Ian. Ian, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi there. I was really interested by the picture on re, uh, regional output since the pandemic, particularly the fact that you show that the South and East are still really lagging pre-pandemic levels while London has bounced back very strongly. And I wondered if you could say a bit more about that and what you think is behind that and whether those trends are likely to uh, persist. Should I go, Stephen? Okay. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Off you go. Um, uh, thanks, as ever, uh, uh, Glenn. Uh, you know, a very important question. So uh, I think, yes, what we are saying is that there is a need in the short to medium run to support households who are needing this most. Um, however, in the long run, we still need to get to a position where productivity and you know less productive regions of the country can be supported. So the, the two should work in parallel, not one against the other. So there is fiscal headroom in our view to provide targeted support and also look towards long-term public investments and then you know, encouraging private investments as well uh, in, in good green and globally relevant activities. So one doesn't cut against the other. The problem, however, also it seems is that the households who are needing the help most, this population is increasing. So this population has started increasing from the time of the pandemic. And so it is not only, <laughs> one cannot just focus on the lowest decile or maybe you know parts of the second decile. The struggles are continuing all the way almost up to the middle of the distribution. We do not as such have instruments that can target individuals and households who are most at need. The lower at the lower end, there is of course universal credit and, and the institutions which are uh, supporting that. But beyond that, we do not have these uh, you know, instruments are uh, targeting instruments available. So we think that more thinking is required there, but certainly we need help where people are needing them most. On the question of South and East, uh, excellent question. Um, maybe I'm speaking slightly out of turn here, Ms. Okay, so the elephant in the room is of course uh, Brexit as well and, and the uh, uh, trade and other uh, uh, barriers that it has placed upon the UK economy as a whole and regions thereof. Um, and 
there are met beyond metropolitan areas in the Southeast, it is not true that the whole of the Southeast has been performing very well. This is a point to be uh, uh, you know, emphasized. And I think they, will, they are dragging the South and East drawn down. Of course, we are combining the South and East together here. So that means the Southeast, the Southwest and the East of England. But even if we go more granular, we can still find that there are pockets there which are dragging things down. Thank you. Thanks, Arnab. Um, Chris, I appreciate you've got your hand up, but maybe we'll pursue that um, offline later. Um, I just wanted to get in two more questions. One is from Jenny Sutton. So Jenny, if you can unmute yourself. Hi. Yes, um, so my question is, uh, given the large level of unsecured debt um, in the population, what does that mean in terms of risks of default and uh, potential impact on the banking sector? Okay, I'm actually gonna um, ask if, uh, Barry if he wants to answer uh, this one, as um, he is by far and away the uh, most expert in banking matters among us. Teams made me sound like the most indebted one amongst us too. Uh, perhaps that's right. I, risks have increased of default. That's absolutely clear. Um, and, and it's clear because um, incomes are not keeping pace with inflation and interest rates are going up. Um, the, I suppose the question is, are those risks um, sufficiently high as to be very worrying. I mean, my, my guess would be not. Um, and what I'd say in, in defense of that sort of guess as a response is that if you look at the latest um, quarterly results from banks and annual results from banks in the UK, they've been increasing provisions against bad debts or against potential bad debts. So um, coming from a strong position of um, reserves, I. I don't think there's the sort of risks to the banking sector at, at the moment that, um, you know, the, the questions seem to be driving towards. Um, Thanks, Barry. That's quite reassuring. Um, I'm going to tackle Leslie Brennan's question uh, very quickly. Um, Leslie, your question is on public investment. How does the UK compare to other advanced countries with respect to public investment? We're woeful. We invest way less or I should say our government invests way less as a percentage of GDP than other countries. And that's the, that is the issue and why we're trying to push for more. Uh, do we have any ideas on how to persuade the majority that that's a sensible policy option? Um, well, I, I think we'd be more than happy to take ideas from anyone. So if you have any ideas, please email us and let us know. Um, okay, I've got one more question. Uh, is from um, Marin. Marin, if you could unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, sorry, Marinus Hauser, please. Sorry, I probably woefully mispronounced your name there. So apologies for that. Can you hear me? We can. We can. Uh, uh, it's something that that uh, that may have maybe related to Brexit. Uh, before Brexit, uh, UK employers were among the first in the European Union to exploit the possibilities of a very large mobile labor force, uh, the Polish plumber and so on. Uh, I assume that since Brexit, that source has more or less dried up and may not have been replaced by anything else. So then you are stuck with the previous relatively uh, sedentary labor force that, that you traditionally have with people in the Northeast uh, not being able to move to London to uh, alleviate bottlenecks there and, and so on. Um, is, that, is that something that, that may have had an impact on uh, the regional distribution as it is now, and also on the uh, lack of ability to, uh, to realize that investment? Because uh, you, if you have, an, uh, if you have uh, very low stocks of um, infrastructure and, and other capital in, in, in an economy, um, it, it takes a relatively, <clears throat> it takes a long time to alleviate those if you have to work with residential 
labor forces rather than mobile ones. It's, it's, uh, I, I don't understand it any further, but I think it's quite clear what I mean. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's a, an interesting question because people talk a lot about the, the labor supply issues uh, caused by the fact we don't have migration as much as, exactly, as we yeah. might have used to. That's the aggregate point. But you make a very interesting uh, point about uh, mobility within the country. I, I, I don't know, Arnab, if you have anything to, um, to say on the links between that and regional inequalities. I, I think it is a, a very important question. So in, in terms of the models that we have, uh, these models uh, allow for a mobility of factor inputs, particularly labor. Um, so it, at a modeling level, we uh, do have it. However, the period since Brexit has been relatively short. So have we been able to model this sufficiently well, both uh, migration within the country, uh, potential for migration or, you know, labor mobility that, you know, the process of Brexit has generated, uh, you know, immigration potentially, uh, you know, reducing from the European Union is that uh, to some extent covered by immigration from rest of the world and so on. So these are questions that are uh, very important for us. And we, we think about this. I do, we do not have enough data at the moment to do it, but we these are these are questions that we are thinking about, or you know we are actively debating. Thank you. These are very important questions. Thanks, Arnav. I, I agree. Actually, it's a really important question, and in in general, I mean issues around labour supply, both the rise in inact, inactivity, uh, the general tightness of the labour market, the issues around migration. Um, all of these things are, um, are certainly not helping, shall we say. Um, on that note, because uh, we are already over time, I'm, I'm going to call the event to a halt. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming along and for some really, really excellent questions. I'd like, of course, to thank my colleagues, uh, Arnab, Kamar, and Barry for their presentations. And also my colleagues, Neil and Rihanna, for making this uh, all happen in terms of the technology. And um, yeah, with the, let's continue the conversation. If, if people have questions, uh, points they want to raise, then just feel free to, to get in touch with us by email, and uh, we will endeavor to respond. But uh, for now, thanks, everyone. See you soon. Thank you.